reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At the time, Jesus revealed himself to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together there were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked him his garment in for he was lightly clad and he jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards and dragging the net with the fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with some fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. And Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized that it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them in like manner the fish. This was now the third time Jesus revealed to his disciples, was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christos vos cres. Vo istino vos cres. Christos anesti, alitos anesti. Happy Easter and happy Pascha. Here it is, the third Sunday in the feast of the great season of the resurrection. And I just got to say, after uh, reading this gospel earlier this morning, as I was making some preparations to put a video together, that in some ways it's kind of it's a realistic gospel, and I'm going to explain that. In this gospel, in many ways, hope in this gospel is born out of disappointment and discouragement. And I, like, I think that's a good thing in some ways. This gospel is a gospel all about reality. Now, let me kind of back up and explain what I'm talking about. The disciples, although there's a sense of, yes, they kind of understand that Jesus is risen, they, they, some of them have seen the Lord, and they uh, are rejoicing, but they still don't understand. And their, their whole idea was that Jesus was going to be a political, if you will, uh, leader, a political reformer, maybe even a political, uh, you know, revolutionary, you know, and that their life as they know it, in this context, this, this earthly life, this corporeal life was going to become, you know, much different and even better for them. They were going to, they were going to cash in, you know. And so, although, yes, Jesus is risen and it's like, okay, this is wonderful. We, we're happy that the Lord is risen, whatever that means. And, you know, and even then they're probably even doubting to some extent, did he really is, is what we're experiencing, what we saw, was that real? You know, it's like they're still kind of, that's why they call this period the mystagogia. You're trying to figure it out. And, and so, you know, when we see these uh, gospel readings for the, the, the Sundays in, in Easter, there's, there's joy, but there's kind of this, there's this sense of, I, we don't really quite understand what's really going on. And, and so what we find is the disciples, I think, Basically, they realize that their idea, their understanding of what the, the mission of Christ was all about and how it was going to be played out post-resurrection, none, none of that's coming to fruition. You know, they're not being seated on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, they're not, they're not you know, inheriting great wealth and property and power and prestige. Those things aren't happening. And so I guess they, because you know, their mindset is only focused on this one narrow thing of this is how it should be. 
This is how it should be. Now I'm going to get to this. What's what's really going on? See, it's the camera right over there. Where's the camera? The camera's oh, camera's right there. Okay, I need to look over this way. Okay, so um, because it it has to tie in, I think, with where we're at in our church today. But I'll get to that in just a moment. So they're discouraged. Let's just say that. That's the bottom line. Point one, they're discouraged. And what do they do when they're discouraged? Well, they go back to their old life. <laughs> it's kind of like a lot of us do that. You know, we didn't work out, didn't get the promotion. Uh, you know, the, the, the woman we fell in love with, the, didn't, didn't, she didn't it, it reciprocate, you know, and, you know, what do we do now? You know, the, the move that I thought was going to make everything wonderful and great in my life, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out to have just as many problems as, as my old life, you know, my old town that I lived in, you know, everything is just not coming around. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a real bitter pill to swallow because why they're, they're focused on what they think it should be. Okay. And yet, and this is the, 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 the part two is the hopeful part is that even in their discouragement, you know, they go back to their old ways of life. They go back to fishing. That's basically, I think the message of this gospel is that, you know, Peter's sitting there and they're all kind of like going, well, okay, I guess Jesus is risen from the dead, but that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of, you know, impact and significance in my life right now. And, and so they're like waiting for something to happen. We're, we call that Pentecost in a few days. But so they get discouraged and they go back to their old ways of life. And yet, in the midst of their discouragement, their disappointment, their sadness even, their depression, who shows up? Well, the wonderful message is that Jesus shows up in the midst of those disappointing times, you know? And he invites them, you know, he, in fact, he, he's like, okay, these poor guys, you know, they're, they're discouraged and now they, they go back to their life and they find out that their life that they left is just it wasn't that great to begin with, and now it's even worse because they can't even they can't even resume the the tasks of being a successful fisherman. You know, they don't they catch nothing. And I think Jesus takes a little bit of pity on them and says, "Okay, I got to give these guys a little bit of encouragement because they're just they're just as low as a rug." And he says, "Well, maybe if you cast the net on the other side, in other words, don't you do what I'm trying to tell you to do." And when you do that, guess what happens? When we do what Jesus tells us to do, then things begin to get better. They, they begin to make sense. They catch this huge number of fish, and in some ways even that's kind of a bit of a, a troubling thing because it, it's overwhelming now. now. Now they're being, you know, from, from dearth to great blessing and abundance, you know, now what do you do? You know, in other words, you know, things are always constantly in a state of change and flux. So they drag this, you know, net full of 153 fish, we're told. You know, at the time, I think some theologians, you know, kind of speculated that that was analog analogous to the, the nations of the world at the time, maybe. I don't know. You know, and so they drag this ashore. And, of course, Peter, I mean, of course, Jesus has, you know, waiting for them this wonderful meal, you know, of, of bread and fish and... Uh, and they, they eat, and they're, they're still kind of questioning, who is this? It's like, well, the old saying is, I ever had a friend of mine tell me this cute story, and it was, I was in one of those moods, you know, I was, I was kind of coming out of my finals you know, in, a, in a semester of college. Didn't do that well. I didn't fail anything, but I, I could have done better. And I was discouraged a bit, and he, we were, I was working with my friend, he's an electrician, and I was just kind of helping him out one day. He says, hey, I heard a Heard a cute, cute joke. You want to hear it? I said, okay, sure. And it's one of those jokes when you're so down that anything it will maybe tickle your funny bone because, you know, you're just so susceptible to just anything of humor. Uh, and so he says, uh, there's a little Sunday school girl. And so the Sunday school teacher says, what's, you know, gray and has big fluffy tail, lives in trees and gets acorns, stores acorns for the winter. And the little kids are like six years old. They're all looking around at each other. And this is a Sunday school class now. And so this one little girl kind of sheepishly raises her hand and says, and the teacher goes, yes, Sally? And she goes, well, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. 
And again, here the disciples, and they, they, they sense that there's this understanding that this is Jesus, although they still don't quite fully recognize him. And, and so you're probably wondering where I'm going with all this. Because, and then of course we have the great uh, threefold, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then tend my lambs. You know, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he and goes, then feed my sheep, okay? And I saw a video today, which is, could, could be very, very discouraging because right now we're going through, we're just kind of coming out of the pandemic. It looks like the pandemic, please, please God is kind of waning as the variants get lesser and lesser severe, although some of them are more uh, uh, infectious, they're, they're less severe, which is kind of a sign that na nature is taking its course. Um, and, uh, but I would say we're going through a pandemic of wokeism. Yeah, wokeism. In other words, people who uh, have had gripes, and, and I'm not saying that they don't have legitimate gripes, but they focus on, you know, past wounds, and sometimes they over-exaggerate, you know, somebody who has maybe slighted them or maybe even a, a, a hurt them in some way with words or with actions or both. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way, but, but people are just so angry and disappointed at the church that they literally, there's, I guess the Jesuits are just absolutely just rubbing their hands with glee because they, they're looking at the future and saying, there won't be any more priests. You know, there won't be any more priests. They're all going away. And soon, please God, the church will be in the hands of the laity and we'll get rid of all this evil clericalism. You know, clericalism is not an attire. You know, they, they think that priests that wear cassocks and say the traditional Latin mass, those are the clerical ones. No. Clericalism is an ugly attitude. You know, and uh, a lot of people that claim that they're not clerical who never wear a collar if they're priests, and please don't call me father, call me Jim, uh, they happen to be probably more clerical and more, I'm going to say it, rigid the most traditional priests that just want to, you know, embrace their faith and live their faith the best that they can. Weak sinners that we are, okay? Because why? They think they know better. They think that their, their idea of the church, you know, which is kind of their own power right now. Uh, and again, that's what Jesus kind of warned us against is, you know, don't try to assume power like the secular world. Don't do that. That's a bozo no-no, kids. And so they, they believe that the church that we have inherited from the apostles, you know, apostolic times, the Orthodox Catholic faith, well, that faith has to die out. It has to change, it has to go away, it has to be, you know, subdued. It has to be replaced by this new global, one world, you know, kind of wokeism kind of thing. And the reality is that no, no, Yes, the church is wounded. There's no doubt about that. I'm not going to deny that. That would be, that'd be ludicrous. But what it means is that people, men and women of courage and fortitude and understanding and wisdom and courage, they're the ones now that are called upon, whether they like it or not, whether we like it or not, to, to, to roll up their sleeves and, and start the repair work. I was watching an old movie that I remember as a, a young boy watching uh, many, many times, and I just saw it again for the th probably the umpteenth time last night, uh, called Away All Boats. Away All Boats. It's all about uh, this uh, big transport ship that takes the, uh, the landing craft vehicles to the beaches. And that's their mission. And they're not a battleship. They're not an aircraft carrier, but they're in a, a transport ship, and they, they transport the, the troops and get them, you know, as close as they can to... Uh, the shoreline so that the boats can launch and take the, the Marines uh, onto the beach. And it's a, it's a beautiful old, uh, well at the time it wasn't old, it was a brand new ship. And so the, the, the thing is it's played, the, the captain is played by Jeff Chandler who plays this very dashing and very, very, I wouldn't say he's autocratic, but he's, he's a no-nonsense kind of a captain. He loves the ship, he loves his crew. But he only will accept, you know, the best from them. And he kind of, you know, you see him interacting with different members, whether it's his officers or even the lowly garbage disposal guy. It's kind of a cute scene. 
Uh, he's not an autocrat. He's not. A, he's not a. He's not a, um, a dictator. He's not a tyrant. But he's just. He runs a taut ship, and that's what you need. And so there's a couple. There's one guy who's also a former merchant marine who was a captain. But when he came into the navy, he had to take two grades down. So he's now just a lieutenant. And so, but the captain knows that this guy is highly capable. You know, and there's a sense that the captain kind of like goes, if something ever happens to me, you're probably the guy that's going to take over this this command of the ship because of your experience in real world. And sure enough, in the middle of the, uh, one of the operations, the kamikazes come and they bombard the ship and it, it starts, you know, it, it takes some pretty big hits and it starts to list to one side and it's sinking. And a lot of people are like, okay, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta abandon ship. We gotta, you know, this is, we're, we're done here. There's nothing more we can do. And yet this guy who was the, uh, the former merchant marine captain, he's going, wait a minute, no, no, we can do something. But he says, I have to, and it's kind of a spooky thing because he's, you know, he has to go down into the, the lower decks where they're all flooded with water, you know, and who knows what else, you know, debris and everything. And he says, if I can see this one bulkhead, because he said, you know, in the beginning, in the, the beginning of the movie, they show him standing and listening to the ship. Actually, listening to the side of the ship, because he could, you know, you could tell. He said, you can. This one old guy says, you know, you can tell certain things by the, by how the the, the ship sounds, by how you listen to the metal. Is it is it kind of you know, gives and takes, you know. And there's a there's a little voice that the ship has, and he kind of like listens and he goes, yeah, he goes, I think that's this bulkhead over here, kind of giving, you know, a little bit to where, you know, anyway, long story short, uh, probably too much detail. But the thing is that he kind of says, okay, if I can just see or, you know, you know, get my hands on this one side of the ship to kind of figure out if there's a hole there or not, and if it's cracked, then if it's not, if it's solid, if it's steady, it's sound, we can put a, 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 a big air tube, you know, an inflatable um, um, uh, bladder in, into the hole and if we can you know inflate that that will push a lot of the water out and it will then right the ship to where it'll be it'll be say, salvageable it, it'll still float it'll still still it'll still you know it'll it'll still um, what's the word I'm looking for I'm looking for nautical terms it'll still displace the water and still float so so anyway sure enough this this guy you know he strips to the waist, kind of like Peter, you know, and he goes into this murky water. And the other guys are kind of like, okay, they're there to support him the best they can. And other guys are bringing the this uh, big uh, um, generator so they can, if once if, if that is if it's the case that the ship is still uh, possible to, to inflate, then that generator will be ready. And so anyway, the guy goes down, and then he never comes back up. You know what? You know where this is going. And so everybody's like, uh-oh, he, he's got trapped down there. He's drowning, you know. And then just at the last minute, he pops his head up and he goes, the ship is sound. Let's, let's inflate it now. And so they, they, they bring down this big uh, canvas bag, you know, bladder, and they, they do what they do, and they, they right the ship. And, and they fix and they save the ship. And so my, my reason for sh going into that long detail is that, yes, there's, 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 there's a ship is wounded. The church is wounded. But we don't need to be discouraged. We don't need to be uh, fearful. We just need to hold on and, and, and find the things that we can do to, you know, undergird and to, to repair and to salvage, you know, the ship so that one day it can go back into dry dock and can be restored, completely restored. And I think that's kind of maybe where a lot of us as Catholics are. We're kind of like looking at, you know, lots, a lot of the wokeism that's uh, infecting the church today. And, you know, you can get discouraged. You can say, well, gosh, is this the end? Are we just going to capitulate to the world and worldly ideas? Are we going to let wokeism take over? Or are we going to arm ourselves with our, with our faith, our apostolic faith, and say, no, okay, there's some damage here, but it can be fixed. It can be saved. The church can be saved. And again, we're not the, we're not the captains, you know. Uh, we're, just, we're just, you know, hands on deck, all hands on deck, you know. And all hands to the pump. And let's, let's, let's fix what we can fix. But again, we recognize that Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the captain of the ship. And if we follow what he is asking us to do, then we are going to be fine. We're going to be fine. 
again, I had a saying, I think I had a couple of weeks ago that I was, as I drove through some of the devastated fires that were burned out up in uh, Greenville and up near Lake Almanor. And there was a sign, an old battered sign that said, you know, calm seas do not make skilled sailors. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so good sailors, you know, skilled sailors, veteran sailors, they weather the storms. They get through the storms. Okay? So that's what I think I see in this, this, this reading from gospel, the John's Gospel today is that, um, you know, Jesus reminds these guys. You know, they're discouraged. They've gone back to their old ways. But they, have, they haven't quite realized yet that they're no longer fishermen. They're apostles. May God bless you today and every day, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.